Special thanks to our promotional partners at the American Philatelic Society. The APS is the largest stamp collecting organization in the world, supporting collectors of any level worldwide. For more information about membership and APS services, visit stamps.org. Hi, I'm Michael Cortese of Noble Spirit in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And I'm Charles Epting of H.R. Harmer in New York City. And this is Conversations with Philatelists. So, Charles, our guest today is the largest revenue dealer in the United States. He's Mr. Revenue. He is the go-to guy. Whenever I have a question, it's who I ask. Whenever I want something for my own collection, it's where I go to. Um, Eric Jackson, we should say his name, uh, is is um, uh, synonymous with revenue stamps in America. He is... Uh, um, just a, a wealth of knowledge and an exceptional dealer and an exceptional guy on top of it all. He's just a real pleasure. He and his wife, Tammy, um, always brighten up my day when I see them at a show. Um, they're just really good people. Yeah. Um, I, I met him once or twice. Um, I say that every episode, I, uh, whether or not I've met Yeah, him. you're always very vague about whether you've met our <laughs> guest or not. Um, and then usually our guest remembers having met you even if you don't. So, right, right. Um, um, no, a, a, a Eric's just an awesome guy. Uh, maybe yeah. I'm biased. He's from Orange County, California, like myself. Oh, okay. So he is. and I have that. And, exactly. <laughs> um, that's whether I, whether I like a dealer or not is whether they're from where I'm from. Um, no, Eric is is just a class act. Uh, really reputable, really respectable, really mm -hmm. knowledgeable. Um, I I wish every subset of philately had an Eric Jackson. Like what Eric right. is to revenues, I wish everything had their Eric Jackson because he's just uh, he's also awesome. I, I I have only good things to say about Eric. It's an incredibly specialized area that that he knows so much about and is so willing with his his knowledge to share and to it, inform people. <laughs> A lot of people know, maybe they flip through a Scott Specialized catalog and they know, oh, there's beer stamps or wine stamps or you know, just the general United States revenue stamp yeah. issues. Um, that's just the tip of the iceberg for Eric. Yeah. Eric's knowledge and expertise and stock um, goes so much deeper than the stuff that's listed in Scott catalog. There's things that Eric has under the glass at his booth at a show, um, things that I've never heard of or Right. Like didn't know. I, I I look at them and like there it has a little note on, it and I still don't know what it is because it's so esoteric and so obscure. Yeah. And then Eric proceeds to tell me everything there is to know about these things. So um, he's a wealth of information. Let's get him on because uh, he's he's just always so great to talk to. I'm looking forward to it. Let's uh let's bring him in here. Hi. Good morning, Eric. Hey, how you doing? How's it going? Good. Keep me busy. Good. <laughs> That's good. good. Well, Thank you for uh, for joining us. Yeah. You're welcome. Glad to do it. Absolutely, yeah. How have you how have you been holding up? No, we've been keeping busy and stuff to do. You've got enough stuff around the office where it's probably nice to not have to worry about uh, shows or anything for a couple of months. I'm sure you've been able to catch up on a lot of things that uh, have been been sitting around. Well, we have, but it doesn't look like it. <laughs> <laughs> So, so to kick things off, um, uh, you know, mo most, uh, you know, maybe a lot of people listening know you uh, from the show circuit or from your auctions or, or eBay dealing or whatnot. But for those who don't, um, can you sort of give us the Cliff Notes version of your CV? You're, you're arguably the, not arguably, you are the leading revenue dealer uh, in the United States. Um, uh, you know, in addition to being a dealer, you're, you're an expert on these things. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us uh, sort of the, the crash course on um uh, what it is you do and, and how you got how you got here. Well, actually, I've been in revenues almost from day one as a early collector. It's uh, probably easiest just say how I got started collecting. It was remember the well, you guys are too young for that. The <laughs> Christmas stamp in 1962. Uh, um, a little bit too young, but I I yeah. I've, I've seen them. Seen them, yeah. I, you know, I was just a little kid then, and, and it was big news when they were issuing the first Christmas stamp, and that's what got me interested in stamps, was all the news about that stamp. So I started looking for them on the mail and saving stuff off the mail, and when we went to my grandparents for Christmas that year, my grandfather worked in the docks down in Long Beach Harbor, and he had friends from all over the world, and he had all these envelopes with Christmas cards from all over the world and stuff, so... I got a lot of foreign stamps that way. And and my dad dug out his old stamp collection from when he was a kid. It was one of those old red uh, modern stamp albums. 
that you've probably seen many of. Hmm. But the thing, the most interesting thing in there was a 1934 half barrel fermented malt liquor stamp. One of those big orange things. And that's what piqued my interest and nobody could tell me anything about it. And so I, I got interested in revenues because of that. That's been my main focus since then. And uh, so I started doing that and going to the, my dad was a coin collector. And so I went to Stanton coin shows with him and oh, about, I guess I was about 12 or 13 years old. I was at the Long Beach Stanton coin show, which they still hold. But in those days it was in the old Long Beach auditorium, which was a massive building from the, it was built during the depression. And they, unfortunately they tore it down, but that's another thing. But the coins were relegated to the basement in that show and the stamps were upstairs. And it was probably three times bigger stamps over coins. And, and I found a dealer who had a cigar box packed full of tax paid revenues for $10. And he wouldn't sell it to me until I got permission from my dad to buy it. He, and so I had to go find my dad and bring him over. And, and the dealer explained to my dad that, you know, these revenue stamps, nobody collected them. They were junk and stuff. My dad said, that's what he likes. He earned the money. He can buy it if he wants to. And that cigar box, if I bought that today, it'd be thousands of dollars. <laughs> it was just, it was amazing. But that's really what got me going and big time in revenues. And I started dealing in them when I was in, I think I ran my first ad when I was about 15 years old and moved on then got a driver's license. I found out about the American Revenue Association. I, then I saw something in a uh, Western stamp collector about a chapter meeting of the American Revenue Association at the LA Philatelic Society. So I started going to that. And there I met Charlie Herman and Sherwood Springer, Frank Newton, Abe Hockman, Ogden Scoville. And they just kind of all took me under, under their wing and got me going and here I am today. <laughs> So that's that's really what brought you into um, into dealing out of just collecting was was making those connections. Well, that the the dealing part came, you know, buying lots and you started so you started selling things and the duplicates and stuff. And before you know it, you've developed a customer and and in fact, the just got noticed the other the very first customer I had just recently passed away. Oh. He, he was active until a few years ago. So I, he was a customer for 45 years. You know, it's, it's amazing what happens sometimes. So when did you decide to start hosting your own auctions? Uh, that started years ago. I was on the board of directors of the American Revenue Association. I still am actually, but they, they were having trouble finding an auction manager. So I volunteered to do it. And the president at that time said, no, you can't do it. You're a dealer. It'd be a conflict of interest. And, but the members wanted an auction. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, if they don't want me to do it for them, I'll run one and not just pay for an ad in the American Revenue and run an auction. I'll keep the membership busy. And so I started doing that. And here we are. I think we're on the 425th auction now. It's... Wow. I mean, they're not big auctions. They're a couple hundred lots every time, but once a month. Used to be, well, they used to be 10 times a year in the American Revenue, and then they went to a six times a year, and then they got down to four times a year, and then the internet came along, and I started putting them up on the website too. And now it's strictly an online auction. We run one every three weeks. Oh, wow. And they've got a good following. And it's interesting because your dealing is split. You're still very active on the show circuit when there's shows to be active with. Uh -huh. um, you, you've got your own auctions. You do eBay dealing. You, you really um, seem to cater to all levels of collector as well. You've got, um, you know, great revenue rarities and you've got mm -hmm. a lot of the more common stuff as well. It, it seems like you, um, you really try to cover the entire spectrum of, um, uh, you know, revenue stamp collectors. Well, basically, you know, if, if there's someone that's collecting basically U.S. revenue stamps, we want to have something for everybody. And it, it, it's difficult at times. It's a, it's, a, it's a lot of work to maintain all that, but it's what I do. It's, I enjoy it. I'd rather do this than anything else, really. 
Do Do you find it difficult to juggle all three hats, or do you find material crossing over? Um, how do you decide what goes in your auction versus eBay to what you take to a show? Well, the show, we have a limited stock that we take to the show. It's, uh, Charles has been here before. He's, there's no way he can haul it all to the show. <laughs> so we've basically, we've got a show stock. We've got, then we've got our main inventory that we work out of that so on the website and stuff. And then there's a lot of un, unworked material too. And the auctions, I tend to put balance lots in there, sometimes intact collections, especially in the foreign revenues. You can't, there's not enough time to do everything. So a lot of foreign revenues get sold as collections in the auction. Um, a lot of oddball stuff. And I've even put some U.S. postage stamps in and stuff here and there as they come along. And it's just, you know, the auctions, when you run one every three weeks, it's 200 lots. It's along with everything else. It can be challenging to uh, time-wise to get everything together. So quite often the auctions are whatever's sitting on my desk at when it's time to get it ready. Yeah. If you had to give somebody a sales pitch, why they should collect revenue stamps, what is the appeal you think to people? Because I, I, I find them fascinating. I've been uh, bitten by the bug a couple of times, uh, you know, little side collections here and there. Mm -hmm. But what, you know, what, what's your elevator pitch uh, for revenue stamps? If somebody came to you saying, I don't know what I'm, what I'm doing, what, what is your, your uh, uh, again, answer to them? Well, the revenue stamps basically follow the history of our country. If you stop and think about it, the most important, the, 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 the stamps that have had more of an impact on world history are revenue stamps. And those are the stamps that Great Britain issued for use in America, which prompted the Revolutionary War back in the 1760s and 70s. So right there, I mean, without that tax, we may not exist as we exist today. And then you had the stamps that were issued during the Whiskey Rebellion, the War of 1812 revenue stamps, then the first U.S. adhesive revenue stamps came as a result of the Civil War. Uh, the Spanish-American War prompted another issue of revenue stamps. World War I, again. Uh, unfortunately, today, we there's very few U.S. revenue stamps. In fact, the only ones being used today are the firearms transfer tax stamps. And it's impossible to go buy those mint condition from the government. For some reason, they won't sell them, although they could use the money. And there's people who would gladly buy them. It's one of the crazier things that you can run into. But you think the government would take any money they could get, but they don't. <laughs> So it, it really, does, I mean, no matter what era of history you're interested in, and, and I, I think a lot of the, um, the subject matter of the revenue stamps is interesting. Um, you know, I know that the firearm stamps are very interest, uh, you know, very popular and very interesting. Um, people like the marijuana stamps or the egg stamps or the, um, it, it seems like there really is something for everyone. You can collect your own state with the state revenue stamps. Um, it really seems like no matter what you collect or what your interest is, um, there's a revenue stamp that is there for you. That's right. So how difficult is it to decide what you want to keep in your personal collection as to what you sell then? I know that can be a problem for at least myself, my father, and some other dealers. You get something, it's, it's nice, it's valuable. You think other people will like it, but you like it too. So how do Well, you it, it's really kind, quite simple. You know, I started out as a collector like just about every dealer does everything and I, I've still got two main collections I started when I was a, a kid uh, one of them is uh, Washington State revenue stamps you know I they have a stamp for hothouse rhubarb and I got one of those when I was probably 10 or 11 years old and it, it was just a neat stamp and I've always collected Washington since then and I've got a pretty substantial collection of it the other one is license and royalty stamps. I got interested in those way back when too, and I've built a pretty phenomenal collection of those over the years. It's it's a very esoteric area that most people don't even know what you're talking about if you mention it to them. But you, you've explained it to me, and I've been lucky enough to see the collection. Uh, how mm -hmm. would you explain these stamps to people? Because they don't really, I mean, most people probably wouldn't even think of them as stamps. I would say they don't really fit into. Um, 
you know, uh, most people's mindset of what philately mm -hmm. is? Well, they're basically a, a private revenue stamp that were issued by the holders of owners of patents to manufacturers to collect their license fee or the royalty on a product that, that was utilizing that patent. And the two most common forms of stamps of those were for sewing machines that were used to sew the soles onto shoes and boots. And the other one was for collars on paper collars on shirts. And then there was another other patents for book bindings and then a bunch of other unusual things. You know, there was a certain matchbox that there someone held a patent on that used a stamp and all kinds of other things. And it's, these it's are a things neat, fascinating area. And there are things for which there's no catalog and there's really no finite number of, you know, if you collect U.S. stamps or even U.S. revenue stamps, you can try and fill in every gap in the album. But with these stamps, I mean, I'm sure you're still finding new ones um, with, with some frequency, I would imagine. Uh, well, in the U.S. revenue area, I mean, there's still things we find that are not listed in the Scott listed areas. We find things there that are that get listed here and there get into the U.S. tax page, and it's, it's a common occurrence to find a stamp that's not listed in the old Springer catalog. We're working on a new Springer catalog right now that's going to have a lot of things, but as soon as it's published, people will start reporting things. Well, you missed this one. <laughs> well, those, that's going to go on for decades. Mm. You know, some of these stamps were for an obscure package size that just haven't surfaced into someone's collection yet that know someone who did the catalog to report it yeah you know, i find things all the time like that then you get into the state revenues i mean there's probably 25 or thirty thousand different state revenues we find things that aren't listed in the catalog all the time so where do you where do you turn for that then where do you look to uh you know it's not in the catalog where what would you recommend people read if they want to get into revenue collecting is kind of the starting book? Well, it depends on which area they're interested in. I, I mean, if you're in U.S. revenues, you need a Scott Specialized. And that, that's the main listing for the U.S. revenues. And then you get beyond what's in Scott. You need the Springer catalogs for the tax paids. And the State Revenue Society has published a wonderful catalog for state revenue stamps. But there's a lot more of the U.S. possessions, the Philippines and Puerto Rico. There's a lot of stamps. There's some older catalogs for the Philippines. And there's a collector out there who's getting ready to publish a catalog on Puerto Rico revenues. That's going to be very nice. And then there's all the oddball, like the license and royalties I collect. There's uh, Jim Drummond has published some catalogs on college stamps, bank saving stamps, and then a, a three-volume set called uh, Philatelic Miscellany, which he included the license and royalties and a lot of other items. And there's a lot of fascinating stuff in there, but it, the, the, it just goes on and on. You know, the revenue field kind of dwarfs U.S. postage stamps and the number of stamps that are out there. Mm, yeah. and so it's just when you start putting it all together, it gets massive. And how has the popularity been for, for revenue stamps in the past? Since you began dealing to now, would you say the market for them has grown stronger, has stayed the same? Well, I remember uh, I was at, at one of the LA Philatelic Society meetings of the Revenue Club. And I, I think it was the year I was graduating high school and Ogden Scoville asked me what I was going to do when I, after I graduated. And I said, well, I was going to go to college and, and stuff. And I said, but I really wanted to go into the stamp business full time. And, and Sherwood Springer was a dealer and as well as a publisher of the Springer catalog. And he said, well, what are you going to deal in? And I said, well, revenue stamps. And he says, why, that's crazy. You can't earn a living dealing in revenue stamps. <laughs> and, and so I, he says, there's just not enough people for them and stuff. And, but it was kind of the right time of things, you know, the Turner had published his book on revenue proofs and essays, the, uh, and a number of things were happening. Uh, Joe Einstein published his book on revenue stamp paper right about that time. And it just kind of started going and I got interested, started dealing in it a little bit. It wasn't big or anything at that time, 
and there were a couple other guys the chuck and peggy howard out in northern california were specializing in revenues richard friedberg was getting going and towards the end of the 70s there we had big recession that we got into and stuff and stamp collecting does well in those things the george turner collection came on the market about then and things just kind of took off at that point in time it was just kind of in the right place at the right time and and we all contributed to that and there were a lot of factors that all contributed to it and here we are today yeah. and the, and people the, the beauty of the revenue stamps it's strictly a collector oriented oriented market there's really no investing going on in them there's the, this craze on uh grading has not really impacted revenue stamps yeah Most collectors could care less about the grading they're more interested in the story that stamp can tell and so on it, our experience has been that the people who want the revenue stamps pay pay for them definitely it seems like a very pure part of the market. It's um, again, when you talk about grading and all that, it seems like the revenue people are still, um, it, it sort of reminds us all why we got into it in the first place. I feel, um, you know, before you get, um, I don't, before you get distracted by value and, and all that sort of thing. Um, again, there's so many areas of revenue collecting as well that are still very affordable. I would say, obviously there's these great rarities that command high prices, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, again, so much of it, when you talk about the stories and, um, uh, again, to me, it seems very pure and, and passionate compared to some other segments of the market. Well, I haven't thought of it as being called pure, but really it is. It's pretty pure, flatly, flatly at its purest. <laughs> now, in, in addition to your uh, dealing, you, uh, you are very involved in the hobby, more so than, than most dealers, I would say. Both you and your wife um, mm-hmm. are, are give your, your uh, hand in a lot of different things. Can you talk about some of those roles and, and why you feel it's important, again, not just to buy and sell and make money, but to really be an integral part of, um, of the hobby as a whole. Well, it's, you know, I've been involved with the American Revenue Association from way back when. I've been on the board of directors. I was president for I don't know how many years and stuff. And, and I've been involved in the ASCA. I was president of that for four years and been, was on the board for many years. My wife, is now the president of ASDA. Uh, I've been working with the American Philatelic Society and I've been a member of their expertizing committee for God, probably 40 years now and stuff. That's a learning experience. And, and I'm the dealer representative to the board of directors now. It's, it's important to give back. I mean, you know, I, I get a lot out of this hobby. You know, I've earned a living from it all these years, but it's, participating in it and keeping it grow and healthy is very important. You know, you want to, it's been great for me. I want to see it keep going on and keep it great for young guys like you guys. You know, you guys are the, I don't want to say you're the future of the business. You're the, because you're in the present now, but your future is going to be for a long time. (laughs) Fingers crossed. What you're doing now that, involving and in just there's more to it than just the money aspect of it uh, you got to build it so that it stays healthy and keep it going yeah definitely do you guys have have help in your company or is it just you and your wife um there's a lot you deal with all the lots uh on both on ebay and the auction do you have any help there our our, our daughter works with us she works out of her home office in her home she's got two young kids right now and stuff they're getting bigger all the time but so she handles most of the ebay and does some other projects for us here and there but it's just basically the three of us now we used to have Fantastic. six or seven people here in the office but over the years we've weaned that down as we've gotten i mean the computer then using the database and all that stuff makes us more efficient and stuff and gives us more freedom to do as we please too. Yeah, absolutely. One of the, the greatest benefits to, to hosting online auctions or being on eBay as well is you get to pick um, how you want to operate. Yep. And you've handled uh, some incredible revenue properties over the years. You've been involved um, over the last couple of decades in the dispersals of um, some of the greatest collections ever formed. Do you have any stories 
uh, that you can share about, um, uh, you know, maybe again, a lot of people maybe have an awareness with revenues, but don't know just how far some people have taken their collections. Um, you know, what have been the most exciting, uh, things for you to handle, um, uh, you know, again, as, as an appraiser or as an auctioneer or as a dealer, what have been the, the career highlights for you? Well, probably one of the biggest highlights was when Lou Robbins asked me if I could do an appraisal, of the Morton Dean Joyce collection, because there, there were some issues there. And, you know, I spent about three weeks in Joyce's apartment on the Upper East Side going through that collection, doing an extensive appraisal of it. And then after it was sold, you know, Andy Levitt and Stanley Richmond bought it. They, when they found out that I had done the appraisal, they wanted me to explain to them some of what they bought because they didn't, they weren't familiar with parts of it. And it was interesting because I had my notes, they had their notes and some, they were way over at this side on parts of the collection. I was way over here and vice versa and stuff. I ended up handling, ended up buying the, the beer stamps, all the tax page, the state revenues, the uh, battleship printed cancels, and a lot of other material from them instead of them. They started selling stuff privately, so I ended up buying a lot of that stuff and took some risks that you look back and say, I did, actually did that. It's kind of hard to imagine, but. I mean, the dollars involved were crazy, but it got done. And and to this day, would you say that Joyce's collection is the best, uh, most comprehensive revenue collection ever formed? Uh, prob yes. And there, there's a couple other collections out there today that might rival it, but probably not in the depth. Uh, Joyce was, actually, I learned some things about him. You know, he, he exhibited British Empire in the 1926 International and came to the conclusion that he couldn't compete. He wanted to get in an area he could dominate. And that's how he ended up revenues because nobody was doing it in those days. And he basically had the market to himself from the 1920s into well into after World War II. He was a major buyer in the Colonel Green auctions of the, he basically bought all the major rarities and that were offered in those sales and stuff. And he came from a family of some wealth, and so he had the funds to do it. But that's how he built that. And he really had no competition for a good 30 years. The re and the results showed it. I, I knew him oh, probably in the, in the 1980s into, for a short period of time. He was, a, he was kind of a reclusive guy and very, very nice and stuff, but he would come into shows in New York every once in a while and had a chauffeur with him or a bodyguard. I don't know what you'd call him, but <laughs> he always had somebody could to keep an eye on him. <laughs> Do you, uh, outside of your collections, um, outside of the Washington state uh, and the license and royalty, do you, is there a revenue stamp or an issue or um, uh, maybe a, a particular subset of revenues um, that, that you're particularly partial to the beer stamps you mentioned that was the one that um that got you into it uh, the 1934 mm -hmm. um, beer stamp um those are especially beautiful um, a lot of people love the persian rugs is there maybe a a major scott listed uh revenue stamp or revenue stamp issue that you point to as um as uh, your favorite or the greatest or the most beautiful or is is there one that that really speaks to you well the, the, yeah there there's the, the San Francisco match stamp and the private dies. I always enjoyed that. And back in, oh God, it was probably 1975. I bought a collection that had the first one in it that I ever, that I ever got. And I liked it so much when I so you could buy them for 25 or $30. So when they'd come around, I'd buy one. And so I ended up, I had a half a dozen or so and the prices started going up a little bit. So I kept buying them and ended up, I think it was in, about 1980 or 81, when the Turner collection was sold, there was a really nice one in there, brought over $500. But I had about 20 of them at that point in time. And I, cause I'd been buying them all as they turned up, but that one just kind of shot through the roof. So I started selling them after that. I started, but you know, today it'd be tough to accumulate 20 copies of that stamp. Yeah. The, the match and medicine market 
uh, it seems like that's really uh, taken off and, and become a popular um, subset of revenue collecting as well. Those are especially beautiful stamps and uh, certainly very important historically. And uh, it's, it's been amazing to see what some of those do at auction. You know, it's, it's a fascinating area. It's uh, or Joyce had the, the most comprehensive collection of those ever formed. And not, not just in having the number of different stamps he had, but he had depth that was unbelievable. You know, he was a guy who just bought and rarely ever sold anything. So if he bought a collection to buy one stamp, he just added the rest to the stock book and left them. <laughs> and, you know, he, so, and so with those, in, there's so many uh, uh, perforation varieties and paper varieties. It really is a, an endless field, it seems. Yes. I mean, you, you could start collecting those when, in your 20s and make a lifetime out of it. There's enough variety there. The other area I like a lot is the tax page, you know, the tobacco, and distilled spirits, and oleo margarine and all that stuff. And it's just a fascinating area. But, but conditions problematic because just the nature of the use of the stamps. So many of these things were slapped on a package of oleo margarine or a beer barrel and mm -hmm. they weren't, you know, a, a postage stamp was meant to uh, stay on the letter until the letter reached its destination. But so many of the, the revenue stamps were, you know, they were meant to, you know, a playing card stamp was meant to be broken when Correct. the cards were open. So, so many of these things were meant to be destroyed. That must play into a lot of the rarity uh, in, in many cases. Well, it does. And you just don't, Some that's why there's so many of them are so rare and stuff. And, and if you're going to build a comprehensive collection, I mean, you've got to be forgiving on condition and accept repaired stamps or maybe even a piece of a stamp until something better comes along because it may never come along. Mm. So I, I think of the beer stamps as well, where they would just cut the entire center of the stamp out. Well, the uh, they were supposed to go over the bung hole on the barrel and then you put the bung through the stamp. So if, if you get a huge accumulation of early beer stamps, you'll See, a lot of them have punctures in the center of the stamp, and a lot of those didn't get saved, so you don't see them as often. But there was a group of collectors out there saving this stuff at that time, which is why we have what we do today. Right, right. If it wasn't for them, this a lot of this stuff wouldn't exist. So you said you've been busier uh, lately. How, how have your um, sales or auctions been going since the shutdown happened a while ago and since we're all being told to kind of stay in st inside still have you seen an, uh, people an increase in people fighting over your your material whether it be at auction or or on ebay well yeah I, the auctions are especially noticeable because the number of bidders has increased and the activity has increased it's i mean when you have only 200 to 230 lots in an auction when you get a 150 160 bidders in an auction for that few lots it's doing pretty good yeah. and the number of bids has increased as well so there's been a lot more activity and and we've noticed you know i haven't been to a show since sarasota last february because mm -hmm. everything else has been canceled but things have just been humming along you know this is this pandemic's been good for the hobby it's yeah. uh We've been seeing names of people who haven't been active for a while get back to it. Uh, we've had new new customers as a result and stuff. It's uh, even in times like these, it's stamp collecting thrives because mm -hmm. people have, are shut in. They need something to do. That's and this is, I mean, if you want something that's going to be challenging and keep your mind active and stuff, there really is no better hobby than this one. Yeah, yeah. We're seeing a lot of um, new signups to, to eBay people that was zero mm -hmm. buying larger collections and then just keep keep buying. And I'm sure you guys are seeing yep. as well. No, the, the, all these people that have their naysayers about the future of the hobby don't think about it. But people are either born collectors or they're not. And if you want something sophisticated, stamp fills, spills the bill. Mm, yeah. And it's funny that there were naysayers when you got your start and you're still going strong all these years later. So uh, I think a lot of that fear is misplaced uh, well, at times. When I was a kid, I said, 
people have told me, don't collect revenue stamps. Nobody wants that stuff. It's just junk. <laughs> and that's not true. Built an entire uh, empire, sustained families through it. It's uh -huh. uh, you know, quite an accomplishment. And you, you've been doing it for so long. You've been on eBay for an insane amount of time, actually longer than us. I looked at that just this morning. You uh, said you created your account in uh, 1997. Yeah, it was around then sometime. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was trying I th early adopter. I think I had a website at Pacific 97. I think it was really? went up around then. It was one of the first stamp websites. Yeah. I know I was the first person to advertise in Lens with an email address back in the <laughs> really? early 90s. Yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. Yeah, little did you know back then that uh things would would keep marching in that direction, I guess. Well, it was interesting. You know, I bought my first computer in, I think it was 1987, 88, something like that. Because we were putting out price lists every two months. And it was a lot of work. It was all done on a typewriter. I had a, a form that I used to type it up. And we put on the copy machine to reduce it down, to paste it onto the pages. Because they were 72 pages long back then. That was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> the idea with the computer was yeah. to uh, get it so I didn't have to do it. The internet came along and I was basically ready. Yeah, <laughs> never planned on that part of it. Yeah, it's it's incredible how how much easier the internet has made everything, and I think a lot of yes. people are finally um, finally getting around to it as well. Uh huh. I guess my my last question is th this is something that I've often wondered about. There's a lot of revenue stamps that are not necessarily rare, but are rare in private hands. I, I know there are things that um, the, the government still has large holdings of. Right. Um, and some of those have made it onto the market in the past. Do you see uh, you know, there being any more large uh, releases or discoveries of revenue stamps? And do you think that could help um, spark new collectors as well? Because there's things that, of which there's um, you know, only a handful. We count on one hand um uh, the number in in private hands but mm -hmm. um in government hands there's more do you see um a lot more revenue material like that coming to the market in the future and how do you think that could impact the market well i know the poster museum you know they they sold a lot of stuff about 15 years ago and it, you know there, there was a lot of discussion dissension whatever you want to call it about that happening then Interestingly, that there was a wine stamp that there was only one example known, and the Postal Museum had fifty thousand copies of it, <laughs> and and they sold six of them, and they they bring around eighteen twenty thousand dollars when it comes on the market today. The guy that owned the used one said, "I don't care. I'll still have the only used one there is, and that's the only one that matters." Yeah. And he's passed away now, and. I actually ended up with that collection and sold the stamps. So I, and there's another used example out there as well that turned up since then. Hmm. But the Postal Museum's got still got 49,000 and change on those things. And there's, they're supposed to sell some more stuff. They've got a lot of stuff that never hit those sales that they were, they were talking about marking some of the stamps, you know, they're, horizontal and vertical lines on them and stuff. I don't know how the market will take that kind of stuff. But there's a lot of stuff that was intended to be sold that hasn't come to market. And the neatest things I saw in there one time were the order forms for marijuana, which are, if you're familiar with the order forms for opium, they're very similar, large nine by 12 inch forms, but they're in a bright green. They're fascinating. Hmm. And I'd love to see, and they've got a pile of those things. So I, you know, it, it's basically about the only way a collector is ever going to own one is to have those come out. But there is one in private hands that was illustrated in the American Flatalist a number of years ago. It's the only one I'm aware of. I've never actually seen it. Because these are things that would have been filled out by the private individual and then sent to the government and presumably destroyed or stuck in a warehouse somewhere, right? Well, there were very few places that were actually selling legal marijuana for research purposes which is what those things work so it wasn't legal to sell it for consumption in those days so 
that's there were very few of them actually even used but yeah. they've got a little stack of them in there and so i'd love to see those get out it fit right along with the marijuana stamps and everything else yeah it, it's fascinating that they've just got this massive holding of of things that again like charles said in private hands are insanely rare but then mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see if that comes to market and how that, uh, again, maybe that'll spark some new collectors and, um, you know, not, not that, um, again, we've all noticed that I don't think the market needs that much of a, uh, shot in the arm, but it would, it would certainly, I think, help things, um, uh, you know, and in terms of, um, press as well, I think that, uh, this stuff coming to market would, would be a good, um, little jolt for philately. Yeah. But anytime a big holding comes on the market, I think it's good for the good for the hobby and, and it's good for the marketplace. You know, in some case, you know, some people complained about the Postal Museum selling this stuff. And in some instances, you know, it depressed some prices here, but it also brought a lot of new interest into the revenue stamp field as well. And in the long run, it was a positive. I know Mystic bought a bunch of this stuff and they're out of parts of it and stuff they've sold out and stuff it's been good yeah it's it seems like an incredibly healthy part of the hobby an incredibly healthy specialized area that um that a lot of people are extremely excited about and get super passionate well it's an area that people could get into without spending a lot of money at the beginning and actually go for, you know, you take state revenues or even the tax page, you can go up for a long time without spending serious money on any one stamp. You, there's a lot of variety out there that you can build a collection with and just have fun. And maybe you don't want to spend more than 25 or $50 on a stamp. Mm -hmm. Maybe your budget doesn't allow for that. In the state revenue field, you can collect for a lifetime and have fun doing it. That's that's the important thing. People have to enjoy it. Right. It's got to be a when the if you get too concerned about the money aspect of it, it can take some of the fun out of it. Because I've had people sitting at tables, you know, I really don't want to spend this kind of money on a stamp. I said, well, don't buy it then. Don't if it's going to make you feel bad to do it, don't do it. Yeah. Buy something you're going to enjoy owning and enjoy having in your collection. That's the more important thing. Yeah, and that untouched by yeah. um, the the grading and the investment kind of directions, that makes it really um, more unique. Yeah, you know, most revenue collectors don't even care about hinging on a stamp. So, you know, it, it it seems to me like there's so little speculation that it's really a a safer bet in the long run as well. Yeah. Oh, I think so. I've never been concerned. Now, if it's got a pile of hinges piled on the back, that's one thing. But if it's a lightly hinged stamp, that doesn't bother me at all. I just put a stamp in my license to collection that I had to put back together for three pieces, but I've never seen another one. <laughs> it, it, I, that, that's something I've noticed with, even with a lot of the state revenues and stuff too. Sometimes you have to take what you can get. You have to be happy with uh, that's right. a mediocre stamp because who knows when a nicer one will ever turn up. Yeah, And it may never. Right. And uh, ho hopefully, again, what you say Sarasota was your last show. I remember we got dinner there. So hopefully, uh, once things go back to normal, we can um, you know meet up again in person. Yep. Uh, they just I, last week canceled Sarasota for next year. So I said, and they canceled Arizona as well. It's uh, it seems like they just you know everyone was hopeful for 2021, and yeah. now we're already uh, into spring basically without any shows. So. I know, it's... Uh, We'll see. But uh, again, as soon as we can uh, uh, meet up again, I look forward to, uh, uh, you know, you always have interesting things under the glass and in your stock book. So um, sooner rather than later, I hope we can, uh, we can uh, say hello face to face again. I hope so too. Looking yeah. forward to it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Glad to do it. Excellent. Talk soon, Eric. Good luck. Okay. Take care. Bye. -bye. Well, that was a lot of fun. I, uh, I, I, I was looking forward to this one. I've looked forward to all these. I say that um, there hasn't been an episode that I haven't looked forward to yet. But Eric, in particular, is um, is someone I, I really like talking with. And uh, um, you know, when when we were discussing potential guests, he was one that we both thought of very quickly. Yeah. And um, and I'm glad that it was able to work out. Right. Yeah. I mean, I talked to him all the time on the eBay messaging system. <laughs> 
for the boat revenues. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it's nice to, again, we, we, we got into some of the nitty gritty with revenues a little bit, but it's also nice to just talk, uh, you know, person to person, no, not, um, you know, dealer to dealer. Yeah. I didn't I think that was kind of the, kind of the point of this whole podcast to begin with. Exactly. I feel like we say that every other episode too. Um, we can just have a stock outro, uh, <laughs> that we put in. Hey, that was a great conversation. Um, no, but it, it is true that all of our guests have been a lot of fun to talk to. It's not. I, and we say the same things over and over, but it's not canned. It's not trite. It's, I think, because you and I actually really enjoy uh, what we're doing. I, you know, these are people that I feel like I know, and then I end up learning something new about them every time we talk. Exactly, which is also uh, our our new catchphrase. Something that was intended for this for this podcast, this show, yeah. was to to show people that these are just people who love stamps. People it's amazing that we are following through on our mission statement yeah. incredible yeah. um no that was, that was great having eric on um uh we should uh maybe even talk to his wife tammy at some point since she's the president of the asda yeah might be fun uh, that would be the the first uh couple of uh, the conversations with philatelists ever featured Good so um so you know maybe maybe she's someone we can talk to in the future as well mm -hmm. yeah we talked to dana about how they're helping bring people online, but maybe we can talk to Tammy about the future of the ASDA. And what Absolutely. She, I, I think that would be a lot of fun. Again, um, you know, the, the first uh, conversations with philatelists, uh, married couple would be, would be cool. Cause they're, they're both so involved in the hobby and they're both such good people. Um, uh, in addition to, again, Eric's uh, philatelic expertise is unmatched when it comes to revenues, but again, they, they're just, I just love them both. Yeah, you um, too often with with both husband and wife being equally so invested, often and equally, um, with, you know, with impressive accolades. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, let's make Tammy one of our if she's uh, if she agrees, let's make her one of our future guests. Yeah. Uh, but in the meantime, if people want to listen to us, um, the usual spiel: Apple Podcasts, mm -hmm. Google Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, all the other um podcast hosting sites i believe um we have a website flatlypodcast.com mm -hmm. we have a e email address address yeah flatlypodcast at gmail.com we have a youtube channel i think that's all we have um do we have a facebook yet for now we don't have a facebook i mean i have my own person you've got your own personal but uh... no but i think we should have a conversation with flatless facebook page okay well then um we can talk about this uh, later, but but maybe by the time this episode goes live, it'll be it'll be posted. Most likely, maybe. Most likely, maybe. Um, but until then, thank you for listening, everyone. This is this is fun. Um, our next guest lined up is a mini episode. Yes. Or is this going to air after the mini episode? No, I think it'll air bef before. Yeah. <laughs> Regardless, before or after this episode is posted, there will be a new episode on pre cancels which are fascinating uh yeah take our word for it no, uh whether you believe it or not pre cancels are fascinating insanely popular within the the last or at least our experience in the last 10 years yeah. is that the pre cancels have just been they've just taken off um and we're going to be talking to michael hines who uh if we're lucky might even talk to us about equally exciting perfins as well <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, legitimately, these are two things that I actually collect, mm -hmm. uh, two things that I think are really interesting, two things that often get conflated, um, and I think this episode can help teach people the difference and teach people why they are important and why they're collectible and why there are people willing to spend a lot of money on these things. Exactly. Whenever I come across a collection, I open up a, a box and I see a book of pre-cancels in there. It's like I've struck gold. Well, it, it, it's funny. On the one hand, if you see a U.S. collection that has pre-cancels in it, you basically figure those stamps at nothing. <laughs> if it's like a used, if it used Washington Franklin with a pre-cancel, it's like, oh, that's even worse than a used stamp. But then once you actually get into specialized, and I'm not joking, like that's how I look at a collection. I'm like, oh, there's a pre-cancel yeah. stuck with all these other used stamps. But then when you actually get into the local and bureau overprint local and bureau printed pre cancels hmm. um you can take a stamp that is otherwise cheap and it goes both ways yeah a pre cancel can devalue a valuable stamp mm -hmm. but a pre cancel can also make valuable a cheap stamp so um uh no i love pre cancels i'm excited for this one yeah. um selfishly well so. you got to do one for us eventually
eventually we have to have uh, fun and learn something from one of these shows. No, it has to pay off someday. Um, okay. No, pre cancel mini episode, but until then, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, we are Conversations with Philatelists, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you all real soon. Yeah. Reach out to us and um, see you next time. Sounds good. Talk to you soon, Michael. See ya.